Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and earn money, all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer, so no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since we discovered Spotify for Podcasters, we have had so much fun trying out all of the features like Q&As and polls that let us be really creative and engage with our audience. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Podcast Royal. It is good to be with you. It is our first episode of 2021. It is January 3rd as we record this. How was your New Year's Eve, Jess? It was good. It was quiet. Um, I did not go out or do anything. I stayed home, but I did have some champagne. So, um, you know, I, I can't let the New Year go by without a little bit of champagne. Honestly, New Year's Eve has never been a big deal in my life. Um, the tradition for the past few years has been that I've gone to visit my best friend in Tuscaloosa, which we didn't do this year. And that was hard, but I did go to my mom's. I feel like my mom is the only other human that I ever see. <laughs> so hi mom again, because I know you're listening. And um, it was, I was in the bed by 930 and I fell asleep. I did stay up to watch the ball drop in New York City. So that was 11 o'clock here and then I was out. So it was super low key, but you know what? Such is COVID, so. Right, yeah, I um, I definitely stay up until midnight every year, but I'm sort of a night owl anyway. Yeah. So there's something new about that. Actually, one of my New Year's resolutions is to start going to bed earlier. So um, let's hope that happens tonight. <laughs> yeah, and how's the New Year so far? It's good. Um, I, you know, I'm trying to be as productive as possible and um, trying to get some goals in place for the year. You know, last year I think was really, probably for a lot of people was just a year off. You know, I, I sort of feel like I got off track with, with, you know, plans and stuff that I had. And this year it's, you know, moving forward and, and looking ahead and, and planning things out and, um, you know, not putting things on hold. I hear you. We can't let coronavirus or anything else hold us back. I mean, we have to be safe, but we still have to live our lives and achieve those goals. So I'm right there with you. Well, happy new year to you and to everyone. We are gonna move into segment one, which as always is the Royal Rundown. And we don't have a huge Royal Rundown today. We really only have one thing to talk about. Um, but on New Year's Eve, Archwell's website did launch, which obviously was probably in response to our last podcast episode. <laughs> Harry and Megan listened. And so they defined very well for us what Archwell is. So we have a more clear vision of Archwell now, which includes Archwell Audio, which is the deal with Spotify, Archwell Productions, which is the deal with Netflix, and the Archwell Foundation, which has the motto Compassion in Action. And according to the website, it is an impact driven nonprofit whose core purpose is to uplift and unite communities, local and global, online and offline, one act of compassion at a time. The site honestly reminds me of the Sussex Royal site of Days of Yore. And it also invites anyone to share stories of compassion. And on the homepage is this beautiful letter alongside a photo of young Harry and Diana and young Megan and her mom, Doria. And the letter is so beautiful that I am going to read it now. So it says, quote, 
I am my mother's son and I am our son's mother. Together we bring you Archwell. We believe in the best of humanity because we've seen the best of humanity. We have experienced compassion and kindness from our mothers and strangers alike. In the face of fear, struggle, and pain, it can be easy to lose sight of this. Together, we can choose courage, healing, and connection. Together, we can choose to put compassion in action. We invite you to join us as we work to build a better world, one act of compassion at a time. So before New Year's Eve, the site was very low key. I mean, it didn't really have anything there except a place to sign up for their newsletter. But now at least we have more of a sense of where Archwell is going. And I also didn't mention that under Archwell Foundation, they list about four or five different organizations where their work will be benefiting with obviously probably more to come. So I know that you checked it out because we texted about it. So what were your thoughts? Yeah, um, I did think about <laughs> what you mentioned. Um, I think they listened to our podcast last week and heard me saying, obviously, Just tell us already. <laughs> and so they got out there and they put it out there and, and I'm glad they did. Um, you know, you mentioned the photo of, of Megan and Harry as children on there. And my first glance at Harry, I thought, oh my gosh, that looks so much like what we've seen of Archie. I thought um, the same thing. And then I thought that. Diana. And then I thought, okay, that's not Archie. But for a half second, I was like, whoa, Archie got, there's a photo of Archie that's clear. And yeah. So I thought the same thing. Um, yeah. And, you know, you can just like hear their voices and reading this. I, I hear Prince Harry saying, I am my mother's son. And I hear Megan saying, I am our son's mother. And then I hear both of them together saying together, we bring you Archwell. And um, so I, I'm glad it's out there. It's a sweet letter that they've put on the front page. And I did click through it and, and read through everything. And they did, you know, confirm what we've talked about with with the podcast and with Netflix and and things that they've got coming so um looks like you know they're moving right along into 2021 and and we'll start to see more of this roll out yeah so do you feel based off of our conversation last week do you feel like now you do have a more clear vision of what they're doing sort of um i think i've got a clear vision of the types of things that are meaningful to them and that they want to highlight. Um, I'll be interested to see, you know, it says compassion and action. I'll be interested to see really what that action is and what types of content and, and things we'll see come from them. Yeah, more to come. I mean, this is just the beginning. I feel like 2021 will be the year of Archwell. I feel like we will be hearing a lot from them. So that is all we've got in the Royal Rundown Quiet Week on the royal front. I hope everyone of our listeners and everyone in the family had a good new year and is excited as I am for 2021 and all that will bring. So we're going to move into segment two, which is all about Kate, because Kate, the Duchess of Cambridge, is celebrating a very special 39th birthday this week on January 9th. So this episode will drop on January 6th. We won't have another episode until the 13th. So we wanted to take this episode and dedicate it to Kate, who we both love. Mm -hmm. And to celebrate the occasion, we're going to talk about Kate. And, you know, we all know Kate. Or I assume you know who Kate is if you're listening to this podcast. If you don't, that would be very bizarre. But I wanted to share a little bit deeper dive on her life in this segment so that we can get to know some biography about her and some really interesting facts about her. So Jessica, let me know if you, if this is news to you, any part of this, probably not because, you know, you study the Royal so closely, but I want to tell our listeners a little bit more in depth about Kate. So Kate is short for Catherine with a C actually. And so the Duchess of Cambridge's life has really always revolved around family. In the beginning, it was the tight-knit Middleton brood, which consists of Father Michael, Mother Carol, Sister Pippa, and Brother James. Now, of course, it has morphed into the royal family and her own family, husband William and her three children, George, Charlotte, and Louis. So Catherine Elizabeth Middleton 
was born on January 9th, 1982 at Royal Berkshire Hospital in Reading, England. I always think life kind of gives us little nudges of our future, even if we can't comprehend them at the time. So in one of those instances, Kate, as she has always been known, was actually baptized on June 20th, 1982. The next day, literally the next day, her future husband, Prince William, was born. And a fun nudge having to do with Megan, Megan was born on August 4th, 1981, which was the same week that Harry's parents, Charles and Diana, were married. They were married on July 29th, 1981. So Kate's parents, Michael Middleton and Carol Goldsmith Middleton, met through British Airways. She was a flight attendant and he was a flight dispatcher. Kate is their oldest child and so is William. William is obviously an oldest child as well. Middle child, Philippa Charlotte Middleton. So I don't know if you knew that, Jessica, that Pippa's middle name is actually Charlotte was born in 1983 and the youngest child James William Middleton, which is interesting because that's William is obviously the name of the man she ended up marrying, was born in 1987, which I think is the same year as you, right, Jessica? Yeah, it is. So the family was upper middle class and the Middletons founded the company Party Pieces when Kate was five in 1987. The company secured their financial footing um, by the way, it's worth an estimated 30 million pounds and is a mail order company that sells party supplies and decorations and is still around today. So I love this, um, you know, thinking about them, it's just it sounds like such a normal family, you know, they met and, and got married and had kids and they had these dreams of starting a business and um, I love I love that Party Pieces is still going today, and it's it's obviously been such a great source of um, growth for their family, and yeah. um, and I think that's just really cool. They're very self-made, and actually, Kate and Pippa were both models for Party Pieces catalogs back in the day, which yeah. I would love to get my hands on one of those. Someone has that somewhere, maybe. And oh my gosh, that is worth a lot of money. I'm sure someone would sell that on eBay. So when Kate was two, the family moved to Ammon, Jordan, as her father was still employed with British Airways. And then the family moved back to England in September 1986, which was the month I was born, fun fact. And Kate was educated in private schools, including eventually going to boarding school at the prestigious Marlboro College, which is a word that I've always had trouble saying for some reason. Me too. <laughs> really? Yeah, she, it's a mouthful. She, yeah, thankfully I don't say that word very often, but when I do, I struggle. She, like bazillions of other young British girls trying to meet Prince William, enrolled at the University of St. Andrews in 2001 at the same time as William after she took a gap year in Florence, Italy, and Chile, where William also coincidentally spent his gap year, which just not at the same time. So they, they barely missed each other in Chile, but of course they would end up meeting in their freshman year at St. Andrews. That shared experience was one of their first bonding moments. So it was there at St. Andrews that they met. They both lived in the same dorm, St. Salvatore's Hall. He knew of Kate as they had many mutual friends, but she didn't truly catch his eye until he saw her modeling in a see-through lace dress at a charity fashion show the university held in 2002. Have you ever, I'm sure you've seen this photo, right? I have seen this photo and it is not Kate at all. No, it's I not. Mean, it, it is not <laughs> the Kate that we see today. And it's not so at funny all. that she would have, and, and I thought, wasn't the the dress actually technically a skirt and she yes that is such a good point yes it was a skirt and she made it into a dress kate okay i wrote an article about this the, you've read battle of brothers that book yeah. by robert lacy that book says that kate knew exactly what she was doing when she wore that dress and listeners if you have not seen this dress you've got to google this dress because it is very, very racy. It is very, like I think about Diana and how she had to be a virgin and <laughs> all of this. And I'm like, my gosh, that is such a, a scandalous photo for a future queen consort. It is racy. So no wonder it caught Williams. I'm sure it caught everybody's eye. At well, the it's funny school. because it's definitely not the Kate that we see today. And no. it's really not 
I mean, I personally didn't find it to be very flattering. <laughs> no, it was. I mean, yeah, 2002, right? Like nothing, right. <laughs> not much. Like I can't speak to flattering clothes in 2002. I did not have any of those either, but it just doesn't look like Kate. She looks very young. She looks, very, I mean, she was, she was a freshman in college, but um, it, it, lo and behold, it caught William's attention. So from there, they became friends and eventually roommates, which I can't believe that they were able to get away with that still to this day. And uh, they, they were, granted, they were under the guise of being platonic roommates, but I mean, come on. And mm -hmm. finally, a couple in 2003. So Kate graduated from St. Andrews in 2005 with a degree in art history and William graduated the same year. He had a degree in geography, I believe. I think he started out in art history, so they took all of their classes together, but then he realized that, that wasn't really his, his cup of tea, per se, and so he went with geography. So the first time we ever saw Kate as the girlfriend, quote unquote, at an official event was at William's passing out parade at the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst on December 15th, 2006 so they've been together for over three years by the time she turned 25 the next month media attention was rampant so much so that in april 2007 william and kate broke up william at 24 simply wasn't ready to get married and he wanted kate to be free of the constant press attention that haunted and eventually killed his mother diana in 1997 so the breakup story is incredibly fascinating to me because Kate could have done many things. She could have retaliated and gone to the media and had a big tell all. She could have done nothing and just gone completely away from the press, hidden away and retreated. But what she did do was actually just so empowering. Uh, she did everything she was supposed to do, which is kind of the norm for Kate. She kind of does exactly what she's supposed to do all the time. So she lived her best life. Uh, cameras captured everything because while they had broken up, she was still the most recent girlfriend and still the public was so fascinated by her. Every bit of it was captured on film. She went out. It, she looked beautiful. She uh, joined a rowing team got incredibly fit, she traveled, she lived her best life, obviously showing William that she would be just fine without him, even though privately she was devastated. Something worked because by July 2007, only about three months later, Kate and her family attended the concert for Diana at Wembley Stadium to commemorate the 10th anniversary of Diana's death. And it was the sign the public needed that William and Kate were back on. They didn't end up getting engaged for three and a half more years, but I have read that it was understood after that reconciliation that marriage was a definite thing. She said, you're not just going to have me come back and not marry me. You don't have to do it soon, but I'm not reconciling with you unless it is understood that eventually we will be married. William just needed more time, he said, but she would be the one in due course and of course she was do you remember the breakup when that happened yeah vaguely vaguely and, and i think um you know this really speaks a lot to william too i mean one you know clearly he's a man of his word right he he yeah. got back together with her and and he wasn't ready to get married but he honored that commitment and they did end up getting married and um you know but it also it also speaks a little bit to his immaturity at the time and you know kind of explains in his youth, why he wasn't ready to get married. I mean, I, I read somewhere that when he broke up with her, it was over the phone. It uh, was, which I, so funny to think like about. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, so, you know, today it's like, I, I think our generation, we grew up, you know, when the internet wasn't really a, a big thing. And it was like, if you're dating someone and you're serious with them, you, you break up with them to their face. Um, right. to now, you know, now in, in today's world, I think, um, probably a lot of breakups do happen over the phone or online. Um, but yeah, it's just my most recent breakup over the summer was over the phone. So I hear, <laughs> I, and not that that was an acceptable way to do it, and I don't condone it, but it was. So, 
Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, you know, and, and they had, I mean, they had lived together and they had been together for a long time. And, um, and I think I read too, like, this is a little insensitive on his part. I think he called her when she was actually at work. She was, she was at work at Jigsaw at the time, the clothing company. <laughs> I mean, I think I would have had to have like, I mean, you really got to keep it together in the middle of your work day, you know, when yeah. something happens. So yeah, what are you supposed to do? I mean, that, yeah, I, I think William just freaked out to just put it so so passe like that I think you know he he obviously grew up around his parents in their dysfunctional marriage and he was so young I mean I'm you know 10 years older than 24 now and I can't imagine being married that young and he felt like he had a lot of life to live Kate was his first really serious girlfriend and you know he I think he felt like he had more that he wanted to do and then he went out and tried to do it and realized I've met the one and I'm foolish for letting her go yeah and I mean you know when he broke up with her I I do think he must have been torn over the right thing to do I think it came from a good place in his heart not wanting her to be harassed by the media when he wasn't ready to do something and and clearly he must have told her something to lead her to believe that decision wasn't final because, you know, like you said, she, she lived her best life and she opened herself back up to the idea of, of being with him when he did come back to her. That's right. So during this time, she did work for Jigsaw. As I just said, she was an accessory buyer. And then she also worked for Party Pieces, the family company in catalog design, marketing and photography, which of course we know if we know anything about Kate, that she is a great photographer. She made a notable appearance at the May 17th, 2008 wedding of Peter Phillips, William's cousin and the Queen's eldest grandchild to Autumn Kelly without William. So this was a big sign of things to come in royal code that she could handle major events on her own and without her royal significant other. So finally, in October 2010, William proposed in Kenya during a 10 day trip there It was officially announced on November 16th, 2010. So the 10 year anniversary just passed. The blue Issa wrap dress that she wore to the engagement photo call sold out instantly. And this was where the so-called Kate Middleton effect began. And William and Kate, of course, married on April 29th, 2011. The date was chosen because April 29th is St. Catherine's Day. And upon her marriage, Kate became Her Royal Highness, the Duchess of Cambridge. And, you know, as opposed to his parents, William really did, I believe, marry for love. Kate is his best friend and has been so for nearly 20 years. And I don't think he could have made a better choice because Kate has truly been a driving force in bringing the monarchy back into relevancy again. So it feels, we talked about this last week like Kate is really coming into her own in the firm Um, obviously three children have followed George Alexander Louis on July 22nd 2013 Charlotte Elizabeth Diana on May 2nd 2015 and Louis Arthur Charles on April 23rd 2018 so I'm sure everyone remembers this, but Kate with each pregnancy has suffered from a condition called, and I'm probably going to mispronounce this, hyperemesis gravidarum, which is a severe form of morning sickness that has caused her to announce her pregnancies earlier than she probably would like to, and to therefore cancel all of her official engagements during her first trimesters. So she has produced her heir, she has produced her spare and even one to spare. So now she is at the point where she gets to settle into her role as future queen consort, learn what matters to her and go do it, which she is doing with her early childhood development work, her work with mental health, her patronage is, as we talked about last week, just feels so very much like her, all while being a wife, a mother, and a fashion icon world over. So I wanted to share a couple more extra fun facts as we celebrate Kate this week. So she and her only daughter, Charlotte, actually share the same middle name, Elizabeth, and the same first two initials, C-E. And Kate was apparently a shy child, which I can see that. She seems more introverted. 
than than extroverted and was reportedly bullied in school, which I, I hate to hear that. Um, a keen theater lover in a school play, Kate played a woman whose love interest, funny enough, was named William. And so you can YouTube this, Kate performing in this play, and she says, I can't remember the exact line, but it's something to the effect of, you know, I'm pining for your love, William. That's horribly mm -hmm. botched, but it's it's super interesting. Um, as I said before, and now I'm going to have to say this word again that I can't say, Kate attended Marlboro College in Wiltshire, which is also, interestingly enough, where Eugenie also attended, but they didn't know each other because Eugenie is, I believe, eight years younger than Kate. So it has been said that while at boarding school, Kate had a photo of William on her wall, but she denies that. She wouldn't let William have, have that ego moment. Um, the first time she met William at St. Andrews, Kate apparently turned bright red and ran off embarrassed. Uh, but of course, uh, they eventually became friends. And something I forgot to mention in the see-through dress moment is when she walked out and modeled that see-through dress on the catwalk, apparently William turned to his friend next to him and said, Kate's hot. And the rest <laughs> is history so that sounds exactly like what a freshman in college guy would say to one of his right. friends so even though they started dating in 2003 the first time that the two of them were spotted as a couple was in switzerland in april 2004 i can still see those pictures in my mind and then flashing forward to after they got engaged her first engagement as a soon-to-be royal was on february 24th 2011 when she and william launched the lifeboat Hereford Endeavor in Wales. So Kate is a very traditional woman and she likes what she likes. So Kate chose Alexander McQueen, of course, to design her wedding dress in 2011. She has worn that line steadfastly since. She also has worn the same designer, Jenny Packham, for the first appearance after the births of all three of her children. And of course, she always mirrors Diana's style from when she debuted her own children, which I think is very touching. So the Duchess of Cambridge is not Kate's only title. Countess of Strathern, I, I'm again, probably butchering everything today, is what she's called when in Scotland. And this is my favorite, Lady Carrick Fergus, when she is in Northern Ireland. So, so do you think that they actually do use those titles for her when she's there? Or do you think those are like formal titles that, you know, everyone really just kind of knows her as the Duchess of Cambridge? I think she's the Duchess of Cambridge, but I think it's really cool that like if, when she's in Northern Ireland, Ireland, if they wanted to, they could call her Lady Carrick Fergus. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure she introduces herself that way, don't you think? When she's I would there. think so. I mean, after, you know, because that's, that's her title there. So okay. I want to hear her introduce herself as Lady Carrick Fergus. I would like to my, have my royal title be Lady Carrick Fergus. <laughs> so um, we didn't hear Kate's voice in a in a speech at a royal engagement until March 2012. She'd been in the family for almost a year. And Kate has still never gone on a solo royal tour. She was due to make her first solo royal tour to Malta in September 2014, but she had to cancel it because she had hyperemesis gravidarum, that acute morning sickness early in her pregnancy with Charlotte. Um, interestingly enough about Kate, who married into a family that loves horses and horseback riding, Kate is allergic to horses. So you will never see her riding horses with the family. She is quite the outdoors woman and athlete though. She was an athlete as a child playing hockey and tennis and sailing. And she still enjoys tennis, swimming and walking. She likes to paint and cook, and her favorite hobby is photography. And she loves a good night on the couch watching some TV, just like the rest of us. Some of her favorite shows are Homeland, Game of Thrones, Downton Abbey, and Strictly Come Dancing, which is the British version of Dancing with the Stars. And Kate is 5'9 and wears an eight and a half shoe, which is my shoe size as well, but I'm not 5'9" about five, six and three quarters. And finally, when William ascends to the role of Prince of Wales, 
Kate will become Princess of Wales, and when he becomes king, she will become his queen consort. So the future looks very bright for the Duchess of Cambridge. Happy early 39th birthday, Kate. Happy birthday. We love you. <laughs> and now it's all you, my friend. Yeah, so, you know, I thought today we would take a look at um, what the life of a duchess is like when she's off duty and you know the weekend comes or she has a little bit of time um, on her own and, and what that looks like part of what we do on this podcast is to help our listeners um, take inspiration from the royals and apply that to your own life whatever that looks like for you um, so hopefully that's what this segment does for you today. And we give you a little bit of inspiration on um, maybe how you can plan out some of your free time um, like a duchess would. So before we jump into this segment, I just want to begin 2021 with some encouraging thoughts for our listeners. I want you to take some time to refocus and change your mindset going into this new year. Things might not be back to normal yet but you are stronger than you were a year ago and you have earned the opportunity to take some time to focus on the things that are important to you and to just relax. Um, and that's what today's segment is really focused on, relaxing and doing the things that you enjoy, whether that's taking on new hobbies that interest you, planning vacations you've been putting off, um, or just checking out on the weekends and finding a little bit of normalcy again. Um, we can take inspiration from these ladies in the royal family, um, and, and that's what we're about to talk about and, and how they spend their free time. So um, I think you might be surprised how relatable a lot of this stuff really is. Um, I certainly did when I was preparing this segment. Um, it, was, it was fun to put together. So we'll start with, um, with hobbies, and we'll look at the hobbies of the duchesses, and then um, we'll move down to how they spend their weekends, and then we'll look at um, some vacations that they've taken. So getting started with Kate, um, Rachel mentioned this um, in, in her last segment, but one of the hobbies that we've all been able to enjoy of hers in recent years is her love of photography. This is not a new love for her. It's something that we've seen lately, but it really goes back several years ago. So when she was actually working for her parents' business party pieces, one of her job responsibilities was taking photos of products for their website. Um, she also did her thesis at the University of St. Andrews on photography, and it was specifically focused on the works of Lewis Carroll and his use of photography to create representations of childhood. Um, which I thought was kind of a fun little fact. Um, but recently we've had the pleasure of seeing photos of the Cambridge kids that Kate has taken in her free time. And I think they look pretty professional. Um, I love that she takes the time to develop this hobby. And, um, I, you know, I hope we continue to see pictures of, of things that she's taken pop up on Instagram. If, if photography is something that you're interested in or, or something you've thought about doing, I can tell you the Duchess preferred brand of camera, of camera is uh, the Canon. So that's definitely a good place to start. Um, Rachel, have you ever been into photography at all? Not at all. So photography is a part of my full-time work and let's just say I should stick to writing because I am a terrible photographer. <laughs> yeah, I definitely appreciate um, good quality photography. It's not something that I would say is my strong suit. Um, my dad actually is really good at it. And when I was little and when he was younger, he would take photos. I mean, this was like back, you know, before digital cameras, when you had to develop the film yourself and, and he would do yeah. that. So um, he's good at all that stuff. Not my cup of tea, but Kate, Kate's fantastic at it. She is. So another hobby of Kate's, um, and this is very, you know, very doable for all of us, is gardening. Um, she, I actually read that she did some gardening with the kids during the lockdowns this past year. Um, and she's also talked about how she and William like to grow produce um, in their own vegetable garden. So I think they did an interview with Mary Berry, who is, um, you know, she was one of the co-hosts of the Great British Baking Show a few years ago. And um, Kate mentioned that they grow carrots, beans, and beetroot in their garden. Um, so, you know, that's definitely going into spring of 2021, something our listeners could definitely try their hand at. Um, and Rachel, you might remember the Back to Nature Garden she helped design for the Royal Hort Horticultural Society. Definitely. 
Um, that garden, she, you know, she worked together with some other landscape architects and they put together this beautiful garden with a rope swing, a campfire area and a tree house. Um, and, and looking back at this, we can really see how her work here in the garden was kind of foreshadowing her passion for kids and her work with her five big questions survey that she did this year. So when she was interviewed about the garden space, um, she said, there's an amazing fact that I learned recently, which was that 90% of our adult brains are developed before the age of five. And what a child experiences in those really early years directly affects how the brain develops. And that's why I think this is so important that all of us, whether parents or carers or family members, really engage in quality time with our children and babies from a really young age. I really feel that nature and being interactive outdoors has huge benefits on our physical and mental well-being, particularly for young kitties. This is a natural, creative place for them to play. So I love, I love that. kitties, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I definitely see how all of that, you know, that garden space really ties into a lot of the other work that she's got going on and her passion there for the younger years. Um, so yeah, love it. Moving on to her her next hobby, Kate likes playing tennis. Um, she has been doing this for several years. I mean, since she was a child, um, we know she attends Wimbledon frequently. Um, and then her and William like to play tennis together also. And she's had George enrolled in lessons. I think she wants him to learn, get him to learn how to play. Um, and it's also been said that when she plays William, she always beats him. So she's very competitive. Yeah. I mean, I think that requires a lot of skill. I, tennis is not it's not my thing. I think I have tried maybe once and did not enjoy it. I took lessons when I was younger. I want to take lessons again because that is, I, I think I would like, I don't know. I mean, I'd probably be terrible at it. I'm not athletic, but um, I think it would be a good workout. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think it's an incredible workout. Um, I just, I mean, chasing the ball back and forth. <laughs> yeah. My hand eye coordination is not fantastic. Yeah. That it just wasn't really, it wasn't really for me. But. <laughs> <laughs> what do they say? Our talents lie elsewhere. Yeah. Well, um, so, okay. So another hobby of Kate's, and this is the last one I included on this list, but would you believe that she likes adult coloring books? I love that. <laughs> I, I know. Yeah. So, you know, adult coloring books have grown in popularity over recent years. Um, and I have to admit, I have logged quite a few hours this last year between adult coloring books and putting together extremely difficult puzzles. I've seen um, the puzzles. They are difficult. Yeah. And they've expanded my vocabulary a little bit too, after staring at them for too long. But <laughs> um, <laughs> so Joanna, Bassford, I think it's how you say her name. Um, she actually created the Secret Garden adult coloring book. And she had the opportunity to meet Prince William a few years ago. And that's when he told her how much Kate enjoyed her book and, and liked to color in it. So that's how we know that she really jumped on the coloring book trend. I think when that happened, it was before Louis was born. So I, I don't know. These days, I kind of imagine... With three kids and her busy schedule, most of her coloring is probably in children's books. Um, okay, so we'll move on to Megan um, and, and her hobbies. So this is a pretty well-known hobby of Megan's. Um, she is a big fan of yoga. She has been practicing since she was seven years old. Um, and it's just a way that she likes to stay in shape um, and release stress. Um, Yoga for me, I have, I have done yoga a few times and I have to say I enjoy it, but it is really hard. I mean, it, it doesn't yeah. look like it would be, but it takes an incredible amount of strength, um, to, to do yoga. And I can't ever quiet my mind down. So I've heard that that actually is normal, that it takes a lot of practice to get to a place where you can, really stay focused on the yoga itself. Um, but I, I mean, you know, I'm like you and my, the gym that I go to, they do yoga classes. And my one complaint about it is they only do hot yoga and I just can't get into hot yoga. I like regular yoga, but hot yoga is a little too stuffy for me. No pun intended. Like literally it's stuffy. Yeah. <laughs> literally <laughs> stuffy. Yes. 
Um, so another one of Megan's hobbies, um, we know, you know, we've all seen her beautiful handwriting, um, but she did not get that skill from an elementary penmanship class, like most of us where we learned to write. Um, she's actually a big fan of calligraphy. So she took up this hobby several years ago and she's perfected her artistic lettering so well that she actually used her skills to earn a paycheck um, and pay her bills when she was getting started in her acting career and needed some extra income between her gigs. So she um, taught calligraphy courses at uh, Paper Source. If you're not familiar with Paper Source, they are like a specialty store with beautiful wrapping paper, greeting cards, stationery, pens, ribbons. I um, and they paper have, source. I, I do to just too, go yeah. to Paper Source and walk around. Just it calms me for some reason. Well, we, yeah, we have one here in Birmingham and they've got several locations around the U.S. And I actually went in paper source um, during Christmas and I bought some very expensive but beautiful wrapping paper. And I was quite disappointed when I ran out of wrapping paper after like three presents. Oh. So it, it is, it's not the cheapest place to, um, to get your stuff, but it's definitely a fun place to go visit. Um, and then she also did calligraphy for celebrity weddings and party invitations and holiday cards. So one of her clients was Dolce & Gabbana. She did um, I I think some holiday that. correspondence for them. Yeah. Did I ever tell you I took a calligraphy class about mm, two, three years ago? No, you didn't. It's really, really hard. Like it is not easy. And it gave me a whole new respect for Megan because it's, very and I had I had the deck stacked against me because I'm left-handed but it's so I had to do everything backwards but it's it's very challenging so I don't know if I knew you were left-handed I'm left-handed and so you have to, it's, it makes it more complicated we'll just say that but it is because it, you know you're when you're left-handed your hand is moving across the page right so right. you smudge things and you, you, you ruin it. And so maybe that's why, but it's hard. It's not well, easy. So I sort of feel like when you're left-handed, like you're pushing the pen across the paper uh -huh. when you're right-handed, you're pulling it. Exactly. exactly. Um, so that makes sense. Yeah. And I mean, calligraphy, I mean, it's really an art form. It is. It's art. It, but it, it, once, once I semi got the hang of it, it was really fun, but I never, I was like, okay, I'm not going to take this anywhere you know I'm not going to make money off of this or anything <laughs> ever well, so. I would yeah I would definitely take a class I think it would be fun to to practice but um that's really cool I didn't know you had done that yeah so another favorite hobby of Megan's um and, and our listeners may know this as well um she's really big into journaling and writing so we know she had her blog the tig before she was a royal um, and she could write about, you know, whatever she wanted to, and she would share favorite recipes on that blog. But she's also been seriously journaling for several years now. And she once was talking about it and said, it allows me to reflect on where I've come from. And with that comes a lot of perspective. I think most of us can all connect to the idea that when you're going through something, it feels like the biggest thing in the entire world. But when you look back at it in a year, it was still big, but it wasn't that big comparatively. And I think that whole idea really ties into her and, and Harry's focus on mental health. And it's just a reminder for everyone that time and perspective can really change how we view our experiences and our situations. Um, so yeah, those are the hobbies of our duchesses. Um, I hope maybe you took some inspiration from that if you're wanting to try something new this year or you're looking for um, you know, a, a new skill to develop, maybe that gave you some ideas. I have a question for you. Sure. Whose hobbies do you identify more with, Kate's or Megan's? That is a great question. I have my answer. Um, I'm I, sure you can guess. Yeah, I mean, I would definitely say that you identify probably more with Megan. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I know that you you love writing and you're a very talented writer. Um, Thank you. I, that's a really tough one. I mean, I definitely can take inspiration from both. Yeah, you're a hybrid. You're you're a hybrid. I'm I'm a Megan person, but you're you're a hybrid. I I would say. I mean, I definitely 
enjoy gardening and not that I'm great at it, but um, it's fun. Um, and I, you know, certainly have done the, the coloring book thing before, but tennis is not really my cup of tea. I could definitely get behind calligraphy. Um, you know, probably, probably Megan more so if you look at the big, the big picture of all of these hobbies together in, in a group, I would probably say I identify more with Megan's, but mm -hmm. Definitely a little of both, I think. I am not, uh, I am not Kate. I went, I, in my wildest dreams, I am, but I am not athletic. I am not um, super, uh, I want to be a gardener, but it's just, I'm not good at it. Like I just, I aspire to be Kate, but it just doesn't really go that well. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to, I'm going to have to roll with Megan's hobbies, but maybe someday I can. Keep a I like the life. idea of journaling, but I definitely don't do it. Yeah, I write full time. By the time it gets to my hobbies, the last thing I want to do is journal. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, we'll move on to the weekends now. And, and again, we'll start with Kate. Um, so before I jump into this first one, I was going to ask you, Rachel, what does a typical Saturday night look like for you? <laughs> now or uh, outside of COVID? <laughs> Both. Okay, well, now, it, if you know, we were recording this on a Sunday. Last night, I watched Walk the Line. <laughs> okay. <the> movie. <laughs> Which was so, like, honestly, that was, like, super exciting for me. Um, in a normal world, a great Saturday night for me would be going out, well, if I'm in a relationship, going out on a date, a nice dinner date and a movie, um, or, you know, dinner with a friend or a spa day followed by time with you at, you know, a, a good restaurant and have a drink or two and then, you know, go on home by about nine or 10 o'clock and go to sleep. I'm not a Great. night owl anymore. So what about you? Yeah, I think, um, you know, Saturdays are always the day that I try to be as productive as possible. So I usually start my day um, going to the gym and I'll, I'll do like a group fitness class or something. And then I've started this routine where I immediately leave the gym and then go to my favorite juice place and get a smoothie. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I, I head back home and try to get as much of my chore list taken care of, um, during the day. So, um, sometimes that includes a, a pedicure if that's on my list of things to do, but a lot of times it's, you know, putting together grocery lists for the week, um, you know, laundry, getting things cleaned up. And then Saturday night, I like to just relax. And, and during COVID, it has definitely been a lot more of picking up Mexican food and, and watching, um, you know, something on Netflix um, or football, if there's something good on. Um, outside of COVID, um, same. I would love to go out with a friend for dinner. I love going to new restaurants. Mm -hmm. I had so much fun when you and I were going and getting pizza together. Um, and then mm -hmm. when we went to Vino and ate outside that one night, that was so yeah, much fun yeah. too. So that would probably be like an ideal Saturday night for me is I've got <laughs> all of my things done during the day that I needed to do. And I can just relax and enjoy the company of friends and good food in the evenings. Yeah, we'll get those days back. I believe that. Definitely. Um, so Kate um, and, and William's Saturday nights probably look like all of ours and, and our listeners. Um, when they don't have an event to attend, they actually prefer quiet Saturday nights in. They like to relax in their loungewear, or their PJs, and catch up on their favorite shows. Um, you mentioned earlier a few of their favorites that they've been known to watch are Game of Thrones and Downton Abbey. Um, so I can definitely relate to that. You know, they put the kids to bed early and chill out on the couch. They probably have a glass of wine um, and watch some good TV. So Kate also likes to practice her baking skills on the weekends. Um, she occasionally will bake and decorate cakes with the kids. Uh, we know Charlotte and George both really like to help out in the kitchen. And I imagine Louis will as he gets older too. So um, I just kind of imagine Saturdays for Kate being like a fun day, kind of spent in the vegetable garden with the kids yeah. and then decorating cakes and then enjoying the cake for dessert Saturday night before they watch Netflix and, you know, just a very typical Saturday. Um, and then we also know that 
she likes to go shopping on the weekends, like a lot of people. Um, I think when they're staying at Anmer Hall in Norfolk, um, she tends to run her own errands. So we know she goes to the grocery store, like Sainsbury's and Waitrose, and she goes to kids' clothing stores with the kids and, um, and shops for them. Um, but when she goes out, she is not in her Jimmy Choo's or her Catherine Walker dresses. Um, she dresses down in jeans and a casual top and jacket, just like the rest of us. So um, that's kind of a fun thing to think about as well. So Megan, uh, we know uh, she and Harry are dog lovers. So it's not uncommon for her to get outside on the weekends with her four-legged child and go for a walk or a hike. I mean, we've seen her anywhere from quiet trails to, um, you know, in London or on Kensington Palace, um, walking the dogs. So that is one of her weekend activities. And then if this isn't relatable, I don't know what is, but she, um, when she's not traveling, she's been known to attend Pilates classes and get a blowout at the salon on Saturdays. I think it is my soul mate. <laughs> <laughs> well, and so she loves money. going to uh, Whole Foods on the weekends, which, I mean, that looks very similar to my Saturdays uh, and my weekends, too. Um, so I read somewhere that when she was in London, she liked to go to the Whole Foods there and she would put mm -hmm. on a baseball hat and go by herself. And a lot of times would just like go under the radar. No one would even notice her. So when they were, uh, when Megan and Harry were living in England, they actually um, would get away to the Cotswolds on the weekends a lot. Um, it's about two hours from London, and it's just a kind of a quiet place to get away from the hustle and bustle of the city. Um, so, you know, I think that's kind of a good idea, too, if you ever want to just get away on the weekend, um, go somewhere quiet, look for a place a couple hours away and kind of escape. So we'll move on to royal vacations. Um, and so I want to start this by saying it's no secret that the royals can vacation in style. I mean, we know they go to some of the most exotic, luxurious places on earth, um, way out of the price range of normal people. But I think we can take inspiration from their travels um, and, and kind of put a twist on them to fit our budget and, and our lifestyles. Um, but for this segment, I did try to pull some recent vacations that they've done um, that were a little bit more um, scaled down from their typical extravagant trips. So, you know, 2020 really put a damper on everyone's travel plans. Um, and the Cambridges had to adapt as well. So they actually took a family vacation this past year to Tresco, which is a little island town off the southwestern coast of England. Um, they went bike riding along the coast and they stayed in a six bedroom cottage known as Dolphin House, which is actually available for anyone to book. Um, so I think we can take a lot of inspiration here. You know, maybe you can go find a house on Airbnb near a beach if, if you don't live too far from the coast or, you know, pick another small town or a campground, take your bike. Um, the past few years, I've actually gone to the beach with my family and um, we have ridden our bikes from where we stay down to the beach and it's so much fun. It's a slow breezy ride and you can get all the fresh air and sun that you want and really take in your surroundings. So, um, you know, consider something like that or even just looking for a bike trail in your own town and grabbing a friend or a family member and um, going for a ride. So Megan and Harry actually, their first vacation together was in Botswana where they camped out under the stars. Um, but for his birthday in 2019, um, it was reported that Megan wanted to recreate that trip for Harry in their backyard. So she set up a tent and gathered sleeping bags, cooked dinner, and just put together this really romantic scene for the two of them to enjoy. Um, I really love this thought because... It's super sentimental and so doable for all of us at home. You know, if you have a favorite place where you've been in years past and you aren't able to go back right now, think about what made that place so special to you. Uh, maybe it was food you really enjoyed or music you loved or certain smells or other parts that you remember really fondly. Look up those recipes, recreate the meals at home, create a playlist with the music that you heard while you were on the trip. Um, and just make new memories by recycling old ones. Um, I think it's 
so doable for all of us right now um, when we're not able to travel abroad as much as maybe we were in the past to um, take inspiration from a trip that that you've been on and um, do it a little bit differently at your in your own home. You know, you don't have to escape to Africa or a ski resort in Switzerland to vacation like a royal. Um, you know, pick a quaint Hallmark movie town, visit for a long weekend, um, or have a staycation right in your own town um, or in your own home. Think about the touristy attractions that you might be able to enjoy, enjoy near you. Maybe you haven't taken advantage of those in the past because you live here. Um, and, and give them a try. Maybe there's a bed and breakfast you can stay at or um, a trail in the city that, that you can take and, and go sightseeing. Um, or maybe you can just have a spa day and get a pedicure and a massage. I mean, the options are totally endless. So I hope that provides a little bit of inspiration for our listeners. Um, Rachel, do you have a past vacation that um, you would recreate? Oh, yeah. I went to Costa Rica right around this time last year, pre-pandemic, obviously. Mm. It was the most magical vacation of my life. And I would go back there in a heartbeat. Hopefully I can go back there within, you know, hopefully the next couple of years, whenever I can travel again. How about you? Yeah. Oh gosh. It's hard to narrow it down. I can think of so many. I mean, I really enjoyed my trip to England in 2015 and um, I feel so inspired by a lot of the food that I ate there. Um, I would love to recreate some of those recipes. And um, one thing I really loved about England was just the food was so fresh um, and it was, it was so good. And um, just, there was a lot of really like unique things that you can't easily get over here. So that would probably be one that I would recreate. Well, that's all that I have um, on my segment today. Was there anything else that you had, Rachel? I don't think so. I just, I'm so excited for all that is to come in 2021 and glad to be on this journey with you, Jessica, and all of our listeners. So say it every week, but thank you so much for tuning into episode six of Podcast Royal. We'll blink and we'll be on episode 10. Follow us on Instagram at Podcast Royal. Email us at hellopodcastroyal at gmail.com. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review our podcast, and we will see you lovely people, or we won't see you, but we will talk with you next week. Bye. Bye.